In December 1942, things were looking bleak for the Allies, and the outcome of the war was far from certain. In the Far East, the Japanese seemed unbeatable. In Eastern Europe, the German army was at the gates of Stalingrad. Vital convoys from America were being hunted through the Atlantic by U-boat wolf packs. And despite some successes in North Africa, the Germans retained an iron grip on Europe. Across the channel in Britain, there was a real desire to take the fight to the enemy and to strike into the heart of occupied Europe itself. If only on a limited scale, at huge risk and cost to those men involved. It was to this historic backdrop that Operation Frankton, one of the most daring commando raids of the entire Second World War, was to take place. In late 1942, the options for the Allies to conduct meaningful attacks against the enemy were limited. The obvious and most logistically achievable place to strike was the somewhat exposed Atlantic flank of Western Europe, but the question was where and how. The occupation of Bordeaux in 1940 had been a significant success for the Germans. Not only did it provide access to the Atlantic and a refuge for U-boats, but its position some 60 miles inland made it an ideal harbour for fast surface vessels and blockade runners, bringing in resources from across the globe. Its location also made it safe from anything but aerial attack. Or so it was thought. Aerial bombardment was quickly ruled out. It was decided that a large RAF raid on a built-up city like Bordeaux would cause too many civilian casualties, with too little chance of success. Enter Combined Operations, led by the flamboyant Lord Louis Mountbatten, who decided on a dashing rapier-like thrust from the sea using canoe-borne raiders. So, just a dozen Royal Marines under a charismatic commander began their training for what would be one of the most incredible raids of the entire war. On 18th of October, following a series of aggressive raids up and down the coast of Western Europe, Hitler issued the famous Commando Befehl, declaring that any and all captured commanders be interrogated and executed without mercy. Unknown to the raiders, their already slim chance of surviving an extremely hazardous mission, were they to be captured, were now reduced to zero. The men chosen for the mission were led by the legendary George Blondie Hasler, a focused, courageous and determined officer. He was highly thought of by his men and his superiors, as this confidential report shows. Thinks clearly and expresses himself well, particularly on technical subjects. Has a lively imagination and a leaning towards development or invention. He is in the centre of work which borders on a hobby for him. He works exceptionally hard and long and approaches routine and some administrative work with interest and thoroughness, despite this being at the expense of work which he finds more interesting. He has a well-developed sense of humour and is a good practical seaman who keeps himself fit. A strong character with the ability to inspire enthusiasm. Popular. So Blondie, along with his hand-picked team of commanders, began training for an epic mission. For the time being, destination unknown. Their method of transport would be Blondie's personal invention, a two-man plywood and canvas canoe nicknamed a cockle. It could be stored and exited from a surface submarine and then silently paddled towards its objective. Once there, the two-man teams would place magnetic limpet mines on their targets before making their escape. Not only would the raiders have to reach their destination and disembark from a submarine, but they would then have to run a 60 mile gauntlet of coastal defences, sentries and enemy vessels, hiding by day and moving by night, navigating treacherous waters in the middle of winter and then penetrate a heavily patrolled dockside, place their charges, unseen by ship or shore, retrace their steps and then travel on foot some 90 miles to a rendezvous with unknown French resistance members. That done, they then only had the 500 mile journey through occupied Europe to Spain to contend with. No surprise then that the raiders trained ferociously. When word came in late 1942 that Operation Frankton was approved, the men boarded the submarine HMS Tuna which would take them to the coast of occupied Europe. Arriving several miles off the mouth of the Gironde on the 4th of December, Blondie and his men waited for the right moment to disembark. 
They needed calm seas and no enemy vessels or aircraft in sight. It took three days, but eventually, on Monday the 7th of December, conditions were just right. Hazler gave his orders and the two-man teams began disembarking. One by one the cockles emerged. Catfish, crewed by Hasler and 20-year-old marine Bill Sparks, then Coalfish, Cuttlefish, Crayfish, Conger and Cachalot. Lieutenant Rowe, an officer on HMS Tuna, was in prime position to watch as the canoes disembarked. Darkness had only just arrived when we surfaced. The skipper, the first lieutenant and myself went to the bridge with three lookouts. Pilot, get up the periscope standards and keep your eyes skinned, said the skipper. From that position I could see the boom defence vessels showing faint signal lights, but otherwise my binoculars found nothing to report. The fore hatch opened and up came the canoe and two men, fleet of foot but silent. They brought their small craft beneath the muzzle of our four inch gun, which, like the jib of a crane, protruded beyond the bridge structure. The gun was traversed to starboard, carrying the man canoe and, when it was at right angles to the sub, the gun was again depressed, enabling the marines to paddle away and lay off waiting. Using low pressure air blowers to keep the noise down, the skipper brought tuna partially up again and the routine was repeated four times further. It was at this time that the cockleshell raiders suffered their first setback. The crew of Cachalot had trouble exiting the sub, badly damaging their canoe. They could take no part and had to watch through tears of frustration as the other five crews set off on the long paddle towards the Gironde. Around midnight, Hasler heard an ominous booming sound of breaking waves, not on the beach, but much closer. Immediately stopping, he and Sparks strained to identify the noise in the dark, with Hasler quickly realising it was a tidal race, a natural phenomenon where fast moving waters pass an obstacle such as a submerged sandbank, causing dangerous eddies, waves and even whirlpools. In effect, the raiders had to navigate an unseen system of rapids for the very first time in a fully laden canoe in the pitch dark and in the middle of winter. With no choice but to go for it, Hasler and Sparks led and despite a three foot race, they made it through and were soon followed by three others. But when they reached the other side, it was realized that Coalfish, crewed by Sammy Wallace and Bob Ewart, had not. They were never seen again. Soon after, the four canoes hit a second, even higher tidal race. It was here that Conger was lost, with the canoe being swamped, leaving Jan Sheard and David Moffat no option but to try and reach the shore. In freezing conditions and with strong currents, neither would make it. Before they had even reached the Duron, the 12-man team had been reduced to six. Undeterred, the remaining force pushed on, rounding the headland into the Gironde, an immense river several miles wide, but heavily patrolled by enemy craft, coastal sentries and a group of French-built gunboats just off the little port of Le Verdon. To make things worse, the strong current was pushing the raiders directly towards the enemy. With great skill and plenty of nerve, the raiders slipped past the German defenders and made their way upriver, although when eventually they emerged into the Gironde proper, there was no sign of McKinnon and Conway, the crew of Cuttlefish, who too were destined never to make it home. With dawn approaching and utterly exhausted after nine hours of non-stop paddling, the two remaining cockles touched land here to throw over their camouflage nets and make their first lying up point. Thinking they'd chosen an uninhabited stretch riverbank, they were surprised when the sun rose to find they were actually lying up in the very spot where local French women came to cook each morning. Here they met with their first bit of good luck. The villagers, keeping their promise not to reveal what they'd seen, suggested an alternative location and the group silently moved on. Two more days of paddling by night and lying up by day followed as the men made their way towards Bordeaux. Each morning before dawn, Hasler was forced to choose a lying up spot in an area of country surrounded by Germans. It didn't always go so well, as Bill Sparks recalled. Come the next morning, somehow or another, we had lost a bit of time and it was getting dangerously light again, so we had to pull in and find the best cover we could. We landed on a little island and the Major got out to do a little reconnaissance. Then came rushing back and 
pushed our canoe off. We had landed right in the middle of a German ACAC site. By the time we had got waterborne, it was too light for us to commence paddling. So we had to once again pull in onto this island, put our two canoes in the middle of a field, throw our camouflage nets over us, and there we sat all day long. We were so close to this ACAC site, we could hear the Germans talking, laughing, singing, and even at one time, two Germans walked past us. Well, in this field was a herd of cows, and as cows have the funny habit of doing, they just stood in a big circle around us, looking at us. And of course, when these two Germans came along, they stopped and looked at the cows. And we were dead sure then, this was going to be our lot. Well, I don't know if it would have been our lot or their lot. Thankfully, they had a little laugh and walked away. The next night, Hasler and Sparks, along with Bert Laver and Bill Mills of Crayfish, travelled the 11 miles to this spot, their final lying up position, before the attack would take place. Here's Bill Sparks again. We paddled within a few miles of Bordeaux that night, and made very good time, which gave us time to have a rest up, since the following night was going to be the night. We managed to pull into some very tall reeds for cover. Once again, of course, we couldn't get out of the canoes, but opposite us was a jetty, so we could sit and watch the Germans unloading two ships, which we hoped would still be there the following night. We could hear them talking as they were unloading and so forth. We spent the day in the canoes, eating our compo rations, and I suppose really we were thankful when darkness came again, because this was going to be the night it was over, one way or another. We set the fuses going and parted company with the other canoe, shook hands, wished them good luck, and off we went. I felt very lonely then. Leaving the reeds of their final lying up point, the plan was simple. To paddle straight up into Bordeaux on the incoming tide, find their targets and plant their charges at slack water before using the ebb tide to escape back down river to safety. The two crews split up, with Laver and Mills heading for the northern bank and Hasler and Sparks the southern. As they rounded the final bend to see Bordeaux for the first time, they met with a shock. A fully illuminated city. Bordeaux had no blackout, and so their plan of hugging the southern bank had to be abandoned in favour of moving mid-channel until they passed the heavily defended U-boat pens. Amazingly, they managed it without being seen, and finally saw the first enemy shipping. Moored along the dockside were a tanker, a cargo liner, then a third ship which proved to be the blockade runner MS Dresden with a smaller ship alongside. They passed all of these before reaching a ship of around 7,000 tonnes, the MS Tannenfels. Hasler placed four limpets along the side of the ship using lowering rods as sparks steadied the canoe. About the same time the tide began to turn, making upriver progress much harder. They pushed on, creeping along the dock wall. Although with the tide pulling them more all the time, they were unable to make it further upstream. So Hasler decided to target the next vessel, an armed minesweeper, or Speerbrecher. Sparks placed the limpets, and Blondie recalled what happened next. Catfish was a little distance from the side of the Speerbrecher, and the act of turning to go downstream when we were seen by a sentry on deck, we shone a torch on us. Fortunately, we were able to get back close to the ship's side and drift along with the tide without making any movement. The sentry followed us along the deck, shining his torch down on us at intervals but was evidently unable to make up his mind as to what we actually were. We were able to get into a position under the bow of the ship where he could no longer see us. And after waiting there for about five minutes, everything seemed quiet. So we resumed our course downstream. The pair returned to the Dresden, the ship they'd passed earlier, with a fuel tank moored alongside it. Moving between the two, they narrowly avoided being crushed when the tide squeezed them together. They placed their remaining limpets, Mission complete, and with no more than a handshake, 
moved back out into midstream to be swept along by the ebb tide. A little later, and still in total darkness, Hasler and Sparks heard the splashing of paddles and by chance met Laver and Mills mid-river who had just been successful on the northern bank. They travelled together for a while before splitting up to make their own way to safety. Laver and Mills wouldn't make it. But continuing with Sparks and Hasler, they eventually came ashore right here near the town of Bly, following this exact route inland to begin an epic journey which would take them, with many close shaves along the way, to the town of Rufek, some 90 miles away. It was to this very cafe in Rufek that they came, and managed to make contact with Mary Lindell, the English-born leader of the local resistance. It was also here that they first heard of the results of their attack on the shipping at Bordeaux. At 8.30am on the 12th of December, the first explosion aboard the Tannenfeld had shattered the silence. This was followed by a second, which caused the ship to list and threaten to capsize it. Throughout the rest of the morning, further explosions were heard again and again, with the Dresden sinking at her moorings. In all, six ships had been attacked with mines exploding aboard five of them. The raiders, whilst not changing the outcome of the war, had at least shown that nowhere was safe from attack. With the vital help of the local resistance, Hadler and Sparks were smuggled to the demarcation line, the heavily guarded border within France which marked the boundaries of the German occupied and the Vichy controlled zones. Bill Sparks remembered the journey to and the crossing of that line. We got ourselves ready and about an hour later there was a knock on the door and they had come for us, bundled us in this little van and took us to the line of demarcation. There we had to wait in the bushes for about an hour until a little chap came through. He was our guide to take us across the line. The particular part of the line we were at was a roadway and it was particularly heavily patrolled with guard dogs, which I detested, and foot patrols. He said he would go across first and when he whistled, one of us was to go across. Another whistle and the third one would go. Away he went into the darkness. We heard the whistle and away went the Major. There I was, left alone in the bushes. I'd never felt so lonely in all my life. It seemed like hours before this whistle came and eventually I was away, across the line. <laughs> That's when the first four minute mile was broken by the way. Hidden locally for several weeks, it was once again Mary Lindell's help that saw them in disguise, which included Hasler, much to his annoyance, removing his blonde, walrus-like moustache. The trio took a series of trains to Lyon, Marseille and then Perpignan, and then eventually to the foothills of the Pyrenees. Here they met with two Basque guides who were to lead them in a gruelling mountain climb over the Pyrenees, waist deep in snow and into Spain. Exhausted, freezing, but with the Spanish frontier finally in sight, they travelled this exact track to freedom, eventually stopping at a hostel some five miles inside Spain from where the British consulate was contacted and their epic escape came to an end. Split up once in Spain and travelling home separately, Bill and Blondie eventually returned to South Sea where the cockleshell raiders had trained and to the Granada pub where the group had agreed to meet and have a drink when it was all over. Unfortunately for Hasler and Sparks, they drank alone. Operation Frankton was not without controversy, especially when weighing the limited material success against the extraordinarily high casualty rate to those who took part. But what can be said, and without fear of contradiction, is that the courage, skill and determination shown by Blondie Hasler, Bill Sparks and all the Frankton Raiders was remarkable and more than 75 years later, is truly worthy of our remembrance. <laughs>